So my name is Steve Bishop. I've been a software developer since the mid to late 90s. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my story of how I became a software developer. So uh, when I was a little kid in elementary school, one of the schools I went to had a bank of about six Apple IIe computers. And we got to play games on it like, uh, you know, Oregon Trail. Uh, that's obviously one of the most popular ones. But I also remember playing a game on there called Logo. And Logo was an interesting game because it had, uh, it had a little triangle on the screen. And the triangle, you could make it rotate left or right, and you could make it advance forward a little bit. Uh, and you were doing this through a set of commands. You would have to give it a set of instructions to, to kind of turn, rotate, go forward, whatnot. Uh, and if, as the, they called it the turtle, and as the turtle was advancing, say 100, right, whatever 100 was, whatever that unit was, maybe it was 100 pixels, uh, but you told it to move 100 steps forward, and it would leave behind it a trail, a little white line from where it started to where it ended. And you could draw these geometric shapes on the screen by basically telling Logo these certain commands to go around the screen and, and draw that. Uh, and so the teacher would give us these geometric shapes that we should try to, to create that day. So about once a month, we'd go into the computer room and she'd give us these you know, cards that had some sort of geometric shape on it. You had to complete the shape. And if you did, then you got to go play Oregon Trail. Uh, and that was kind of the, the thing that we did. And I didn't realize it at the time, but what I was doing was programming. Right? I was actually programming a computer because I had to give it a set of instructions to follow and based upon those instructions, uh, it would have some sort of output that we were looking for, you know, create some sort of desired output. And you could go and save those instructions and replay them over and over again. So we were essentially programming our computers through this game called Logo. Uh, it wasn't my favorite thing to do at the time. It wasn't like, you know, oh yeah, I get to do Logo, but you know, I, it's, it's interesting that it still sticks with me today as something that was something I did as a kid that was programming related, right? Uh, I don't know how old I was. I was just in grade school. It was probably when I was in about second or third grade, I think, that that happened. So very, very young. Um, fast forward a little bit. My grandfather uh, was working for NASA. Uh, they were shooting rockets off out of Lompoc towards Hawaii, and they were kind of watching them, they were filming them as they were going off and off the launch pad. And uh, he was part of that whole team that was checking out the, the profiles of all these different rockets that would launch and uh, performance and stuff. Uh, but he had a lot of computer equipment at his house and you know he's very tech savvy. Obviously he's a rocket scientist, you don't really, uh, computers are a great thing. So uh, he had, I remember, a Commodore 64. And so we would go over to his house and I would play video games on there like Pole Position, Donkey Kong, etc. Uh, and I thought it was so great. My mom thought it was great. So she ended up buying a Commodore 64 for us. And that was a lot of fun. But of course, I didn't know anything about programming then. I didn't really do any programming. I just played games on it. But it did kind of keep me in the loop with technology. And I knew what these different um, types of computers were that were coming out because of my involvement with uh, my grandfather. So, um, again, kind of fast forward here all the way into high school. My mom is dating a guy, and this was in the early to mid 90s, I'd say. Uh, my mom was dating a guy who had at one time ran his own telecom company. Uh, he's now my stepfather, by the way, great, terrific, terrific guy. Uh, but he had computers, you know, he had a couple of computers at home. And, uh, he had a son, and his son and I, now my stepbrother, we would play video games on there all the time. We'd play like SimCity 2000, Seventh Guest, Eleventh Hour, uh, all sorts of different games. Um, and that was a lot of fun. So I got to be around computers. But one of the things I really, really remember that I loved to do was use his computer to log into different BBS systems around the city. Uh, now, so for those of you who don't know what a BBS is, it's a, uh, it's a bulletin board system where using your modem, your dial-up modem at the time, you could log into someone else's computer who also had a modem. And they would host this BBS. You logged in with some sort of terminal client, and you would get like text across the screen. Usually it was just ASCII, right? Uh, A-S-C-I-I. -I. 
Um, or it might be, if you're lucky, they had ANSI turned on. Um, there were a bunch of other protocols, but it was, it was a way of communicating and posting messages up on these boards for other people to read. And you could even post pictures, you know, JPEGs, that sort of thing. Uh, so this was all pre-Pentium age, right? This is all pre-really fast computers. Uh, and so I would play these games. I would get on the BBS systems. I would talk to other people, leave messages, chat with the system operator of the BBS every once in a while if they were live, uh, leave pictures, play games. There's a great game on there called Legend of the Red Dragon. That was one of the most popular BBS games that you could play. It was all text-based, uh, you know, kind of turn-based, text-based games. Uh, you could only go so far in a day, and then you had to sleep and come back the next day. Um, so a lot of fun playing on these BBS systems working on, you know, playing on these computers, typing up things. I could use Word at that point, right? I got familiar with Microsoft Word and Word Word Perfect was another one uh, to type up like my article. You know, if I had a, a homework assignment or something, I might type it up. Or if I had a speech that I was going to do in speech and debate, um, then I'd do that. So eventually I had to get a computer. I had to get one for myself. So I ended up getting, uh, I think, I don't remember if it was mom or my stepfather who got it for me, but I ended up getting a 486 DX computer. Heck, I might have even paid for it myself. I don't, I don't think so. I think my mom got it for me. Uh, but I got a 486 DX computer, again, before Pentiums, right? Uh, and this was just before Pentiums came out. Uh, but of course, me being the, the kid I was, I wanted to break the thing apart and see what made it tick, right? This is mine finally. This is my computer. I get to open it up and see how it works. And uh, so I, you know, take the hard drive out and take a look at it, clean it off all the time, stick it back in, plug it. Oh, that's what that plug is for. And, uh, you know, just that kind of thing. You just unplug things, plug them back in. If you're really stupid, you touch the CPU and it burns your, thing, your finger. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff that you do as a kid when you're just kind of learning about computers. Uh, but the fact that I had this 486, one of the first things, of course, that I wanted to do with it was to set up my own BBS. So I set up a BBS uh, that other people could connect to using their dial-up modems. Uh, we ended up getting a second telephone line just so that we could do that, so that I could host one. It's a bit of a controversy within the house because, you know, it's, a, it's an extra expense for money uh, of money that doesn't really make any sense to spend it on. I just have this kid that has a hobby, right? Um, but my mom was gracious enough to, to get us a second line, and, and also because of my step stepfather. Uh, so we had this second line that we could use for dial-up, and I would host my BBS system. And I, I still remember, I used an application called Turbo, uh, Turboard. That's what it was, Turboard. Uh, Turboard BBS was written by this guy named Sean Rhodes, and I really wish I could find out who this guy was or contact him. I, I, He's just kind of lost in the ether, I guess. Uh, but he wrote this Turboard program that was pretty cool because it had all the abil the same abilities as all of the other major BBS systems. It had ANSI support, it had ASCII support, it had RIP support. Uh, but there was another protocol on there that was really interesting called NAPULPS. Uh, N-A-P-L-P-S, North, uh, North American Presentation Level Protocol Syntax. I still remember all that. Uh, but Nepulps was a, I think it was a Canadian spec. I think it came out of Canada. Uh, but it was also the same technology used by Prodigy. And Prodigy at the time was a pretty big name in the internet and you know networking sphere. Uh, and they had been using this Nepulps technology. So, uh, and it was a much more graphical. It was a graphical representation of things. So rather than being text-based, Right, writing text on the screen. It was much more drawing those lines and creating geometric shapes on the screen. And it was kind of a protocol around that idea. And you could have different colors. Like you could create a circle and then make that one blue. And then you could, um, you know, you could make a, a square that was red or whatnot. Uh, and you could even write out text, but the text was not terrific because it was all, you know, vector based graphics and stuff. At least I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was vector based graphics. Anyway, uh, so I love this Nepalps graphic stuff, uh, but of course I was the only person to use it. It was not a, a, 
a really popular technology. All these other bulletin board systems were using, um, you know, ASCII or ANSI or RIP maybe. Uh, and then since other people had to be terminaling in with a, a terminal syst application that could understand the protocol, that was even harder because Nepalps is this really kind of off the wall protocol. So I actually distributed to the people who would log in, I distributed this special terminal application that would allow you to log into mine using the Nepalps graphics. And the people who did loved it, it was great. I mean, it was kind of a, a really cool technology. So anyway, uh, yeah, so I created my own BBS system. I was a sysops, I, was, I think I was 14 when I first set that up. Um, maybe, yeah, I think it was 14 when I first set up uh, my BBS. And I was doing that for a few years. Um, my stepfather was, was a programmer. Uh, he liked to program in Microsoft Access, but he also had a bunch of these books. He had C++ books and C books and Visual Basic books. And he also really, the, the programming that he liked to do was Microsoft Access. Uh, so he was really heavy into the early, early versions of Access that Microsoft put out. So uh, I never really got into the programming side of it uh, until a little bit later on when I decided to pick up JavaScript when JavaScript specs came out. So JavaScript was released in 95. I picked it up either late 95, I think it was 1996 that when I first really um, started looking into JavaScript. Uh, and of course, we had at the time Netscape and the internet was, was just then really starting to turn into that popularity uh, that we all kind of wanted to get on the internet. Um, so having websites and web pages that had JavaScript interactivity and stuff was really cool and I wanted to do it. I wanted to learn JavaScript. So I did. I learned JavaScript. Uh, not long after that, uh, I also got really into, there was another application called MIRC, which is still wildly popular, written by a guy by the name of uh, Khalid Marambe. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced that right, Khalid Marambe. Uh, he wrote this application called MIRC, which you could use as a client to connect to internet relay chat. So I was able to chat with people all around the world using IRC and this MIRC client. And I learned how to program the MIRC client to do a lot of different things. And I created like little botnets and stuff uh, doing programming. So right in that same vein, right around 96 was when I learned JavaScript. And I think it was 97 when I, MIRC dropped and I started to do MIRC. Uh, might've been 96, but I think it was 97. So I was doing, you know, I was doing some programming, 96, 97 but on these languages for things that nobody really had any care about, right? So in this particular time, there was really no call for software developers. There was no, the internet was still in its infancy. Uh, I'm reaching the end of my high school years because I graduated in 97. And there was really no interest for me to go into programming as a career. It didn't seem like a career, right? It, there didn't, Sure, technology was cool, hey, we could get on the internet and we could do these computer things, but it, it still didn't occur to us that this thing was going to become, even in, even after Windows 95 and 97 were released, it still wasn't totally clear that the internet would become anything major. Uh, so when I was graduating high school and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, I was just working. I had no idea, even though I, I love to do all this coding and stuff with JavaScript and MIRC, it just didn't really feel like a career path. It didn't seem to make any sense. Well, who's going to want an MIRC script and pay for it? Uh, JavaScript, I, I did actually get my very first paid gig doing JavaScript in 1998. That was my very first time getting paid. Um, and it was, for a, um, it was for a sports website and they wanted a little image flipper. So when you hover the mouse over an image, it would flip to a different different image. Uh, and so that was cool. That was a lot of fun. That was my first paid gig uh, doing some JavaScript coding. But again, I still, I was a kid, I was a teenager, just graduating out of high school. It did not seem like this internet thing was really gonna take off. Uh, maybe it could, it was cool, it was interesting, but it, it wasn't a, the world changer that we know it as now. 
Um, so yeah, that was kind of my first little bit of a taste of it. So I go into the workforce and, you know, I just do the coding thing for fun on the side for many, many years. Um, I got into the golf industry. I really wanted to be into golf. That was kind of the fun thing. That was where my first job, my first paid job full time was, was in golf. Um, so I kind of saw that more as my career is, is in the golf industry. And I thought I was really good. I really wanted to become a teacher of golf. I wasn't, I was a good player. I wanted to be a good player, but I was really mostly interested in teaching golf. Uh, and there were a few times later on in my career that I got an opportunity to teach some really interesting people. Um, some people, some names, some household names that you might know that I got a chance to actually give golf instruction to. Um, yeah, so a lot of, a lot of really cool things that I got to do for my golf career, but um, this isn't about my golf career. <laughs> so anyway, I, as I was working at a golf course, and this is where the things start to join together. I was working at a golf course, a little tiny nine hole golf course called Villa Monterey and in Scottsdale, Arizona. We, uh, we were almost always on the brink of bankruptcy. The, the course was always looking at getting shut down. We were getting funding by the, the city and we always had to petition for more money um, and, but, and I was making, I wasn't even making enough to really live off of, but I was in golf and that was my life, right? My, my life was golf. I wanted to go through the PGA program, uh, and, and become a golf professional. So while I was working there, uh, one of the interesting things that happened was a school called Montessori Academy. Uh, they had a group of kids that wanted to learn how to golf. And so I was training them. I was teaching these kids that were, you know, anywhere from uh, first grade, second grade, all the way up to about, I think about grade six, grade, maybe it was grade eight, I can't remember, but I think it was up to grade six. Uh, I was teaching them golf and uh, on this little golf course. So they'd come out about once a week and we'd we just kind of play around. And I got a conversation with the principal of the school and she happened to mention that she was looking for a computer uh, teacher. She was looking for a teacher for the school to, to teach technology to the kids. And also they were looking for, interestingly enough, a music teacher. And uh, when I was in high school and also through some of my college, um, through, you know, going through the community college, I played clarinet, I played a little trumpet, I played saxophone. Uh, I knew music. I, I could play music, I played percussion. Uh, so I was like, yeah, I can, I can fit kind of both those roles. I know a little bit about technology. I know a little bit about music. Uh, I can fit that role. So I ended up getting a job with Montessori Academy as the network administrator and instructor for the school, as well as the music teacher. So that was kind of cool. That was, uh, that was really probably one of the best jobs I ever had. I, working with kids at that age was so incredibly fun. Uh, you know, we, we taught kids, I was teaching music to kindergartners and um, up to sixth graders. Uh, that was a lot of fun. But the, the, the school, I created my own uh, keyboarding uh, course. So I taught kids how to do keyboards. Um, using these special cards, I taught them how to move their fingers one at a time, train their fingers to do it, and, um, and then you know, typing sentences and things. So kind of practicing these different letters back and forth. So I created my own curriculum for keyboard training, and I created my own curriculum for learning how to use a computer, how to use a mouse, how to navigate web pages, how to, how to install software. Um, so all these different kinds of skills that the school thought was really important that the kids learn, I had to basically invent the curriculum for. Uh, and, and that was great. I, I loved doing that. Uh, but unfortunately, towards the end of my, of my first year there, I say unfortunately because it, there were some things, it was unfortunately obvious that the, the plan to have me there was not within the Montessori way. Because this was a Montessori Academy, and, and there's a certain structure to the way that you teach kids that having a separate teacher teaching specific subjects, it's not the intended design of the classroom. So um, 
that combined with an opportunity that I got to further my career in the golf industry led me to saying, okay, I, I need to leave this job and go pursue my golf career. And it was kind of a crossroads. Uh, so I ended up going on this um, opportunity to go be golf, uh, you know, go continue my golf career. And uh, then I ended up coming back to Phoenix and um, I started working a series of different jobs, technology-based, uh, as far as I worked for Singular Wireless and AT&T for a while. Um, so I got to troubleshoot cell phones. That was kind of fun. Uh, but that was all online. That was all over the phone. So you, there was kind of a uniqueness to troubleshooting, um, troubleshooting what's going on with the phone and contending with a customer who is not happy because their phone is not working. Right, so there's there's this element of troubleshooting while also trying to keep the person calm on the phone, uh, and you really start to develop those customer relation skills. Uh, and I eventually became a, a manager in that with that company, and and I was it was a lot of fun. You know, it was it was fun, but it was challenging. It was great people that I worked with. Um, anyway, so a little bit later on, I I decided to change my career in back into technology. I wanted to just do straight technology. And I responded to a Craigslist ad for this guy that was looking to, uh, he was looking for tech support reps. So uh, in, I decided to apply and he was really a, uh, I don't know how, how else to explain. It was just kind of a fly by the seat of your pants IT support. I was a contractor with him. Uh, I would, get paid about once a month and it was about half of what I should have been charging him. But what I was really getting out of that was a lot of experience because he had a lot of clients around town and we would go to all their different locations. We'd go to their homes, we'd go to their businesses and we'd set up networks, we would set up computers, we'd install operating systems. Uh, and that was the first time that I got really into like Active Directory and um, you know, being an IT manager, really kind of learning the ropes of IT. Um, aside from all the little tiny bit of programming I was doing through all those years with MIRC and JavaScript, just kind of tinkering. Uh, so I ended up getting a job in IT with him. Um, call it a job. It was more of a contractor job, and I was just scraping by. Just just enough. I'd, I'd have to call. I remember calling him every month like, hey, I need this much in order to just pay rent. And uh, yeah, it was, even though it was very difficult, it was an educational experience. I tried to extract and learn as much as I could from that opportunity as possible. Uh, and I think that throughout my life and career, that's been a big motivation for me is even if it's a job that I may not revel in, try to learn as much as I possibly can from it because there's value in that education. There's value in learning these new skills and technology. Uh, and so, you know, setting up these networks with Sonic Walls and Cisco's and setting up Active Directory installing, boy, my, I still remember the first time I had to set up an Active, Active Directory service. I was so nervous. I had no idea what I was doing. And it was for a business. You know, it was for a company. And I, I was basically watching videos to figure out how to do this stuff. And I was just kind of watching and thinking and working my way through the problem and setting it up and getting all these different desktops to work together. And I would work through through two nights. I think I stayed up for 40 hours straight just trying to figure all that out. Uh, and I got it, I succeeded and I, it worked. And that was really that um, cool, you know? I can, I can do the research, I can do what it takes under the pressure to get done what needs to be done. Uh, so that was really great. I, I learned, I really cut my teeth in the IT industry for several years doing that. Uh, and then I had an opportunity, uh, I saw another Craigslist ad um, several years later for what would have really be a full-time IT position. And that was how I got my job at Gartman. Uh, Gartman had an opportunity for an IT technician. Uh, I interviewed, did a technical interview with them I seemed to, to pass with flying colors. I knew enough to get by. Uh, and so I had a full-time job as a, as a technician that would 
drive around to different you know businesses. Basically the same job I had, but this time I was working full time and I was making way more money. Uh, and this was a, a huge life changer for me. This was probably one of the biggest moments in my life was when I was asked to come and work for them when they when they wanted to hire me. And I got that phone call um, and I knew I was going to be making way more money than I ever had. And um, it felt like I had finally made it. I'd finally had a success in my life. My girlfriend and I at the time, she's now my wife, uh, but my girlfriend at the time, um, and I could finally afford our own place. We didn't have to live with roommates. I could actually pay the rent all on my own. I didn't have to live with, any, with anybody else to do it. Uh, and that was amazing. Uh, so Gartman really was, and, and Gartman is a smaller business, a lot of consulting, IT consulting. But one of the interesting things about Gartman was the fact that they had a software division. They had a software development division where they were almost exclusively writing access applications. And of course, I knew what Access was. My stepfather, uh, as I mentioned before, was doing some Access development. Um, and so when I saw, and of course, I knew a little bit about JavaScript, and, and of course, I've been doing IRC, um, MIRC scripting. So I knew programming. I didn't know Access. I didn't know Visual Basic for applications. I, I didn't know C Sharp or any other languages other than JavaScript and, and this MIRC scripting language. Um, so while I was working at Gartman, for Gartman, doing this IT stuff, a couple of years into it, I said, hey, you know, um, I've got a little bit of some programming skills. I'd really like to go work at that part of the, of the company. I'd like to do some software development. Uh, and so they said, well, okay, you know, uh, sure, you know, we'll, we'll give you some part-time time over there. You can work on a few projects that we, that we might have available. We do kind of have a need. We've, we've got a lot of work to do. So sure, you know, uh, and they gave me about six months to train myself. They, they le legitimately gave me about six months for me to just learn how to program in Access. Uh, and so I learned, I remember the very first application I wrote in Access was a football pool management system. Uh, <laughs> so I, you know, how to, how to take money, how to set up each uh, each week's matchups, um, print those out in an access report so that and distribute them to everybody, take all of their entries and enter it into the system, uh, calculate who wins based upon you know entering all the all the um, all the scores for each week to determine who the winner was at the end of the pool. And that was a really good like use case. It was a really good use case for my very first application. And I, I got it working without macros. I did it with VBA, um, but it, it took me about six months of learning Visual Basic for applications and working with Microsoft Access. And that was the first time that I'd seen a database and had to learn SQL, right? And writing SQL queries. Uh, so it was a really good enterprise platform. And I've, I've always found access to be a great platform for learning because of the fact that you have to integrate all these different skills. You have to generate a user interface that makes sense and is intuitive and, and you have to write the code logic behind all of the interactions of the forms and you have to figure out how to write reports. You have to write queries and SQL queries and you have to set up database tables and uh, normalize your tables in such a way that it makes sense and then you have to do all the data entry and uh, you know and keep track of things, have an archive. So all of this stuff, I really sunk, you know, I really got a good example of it when I was trying to write that little pool, you know, football pool application for the office. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was really, really when I got it. I had a great opportunity with Gartman because I, I built up a, a couple of years of relationship with them doing this IT support. I mentioned that I knew a little bit of programming with JavaScript and MIRC and I was really interested in helping them out in their software division and learning software. Uh, and of course, they, they so much kudos to them for giving me the opportunity to learn. I mean, what other company can you think of would give you six months to learn something on the job? Uh, you know, just, just on the job. So, you know, half my day I would go out and, and troubleshoot networks and computers. And then the other half of the day I'd be learning Microsoft Access. Uh, and I'd go home and I'd learn a little bit more and I'd play a little bit more. 
uh, until eventually, you know, I'd be going out to different clients and trying to solve their software problems. And, uh, you know, I went, I remember going to a loan company and trying to help build out their loan management systems uh, and how they were answering phones and keeping track of all their loans. And uh, it was so, it was such a great opportunity that Gartman gave me. Uh, that I am forever in debt to them for those opportunities. And I, I still I still think about those guys every day. I really do. Um, how, how much of an opportunity they gave me and changed my life. So uh, I was doing a lot of... Con I was starting to get better and better at Gartman. Um, obviously, I learned that Access had some limitations, especially in the web area. And of course, I had some JavaScript experience. So I was kind of like, yeah, there's this web thing. I need to learn another language though that will allow me to build web applications because web is really becoming the hot market item now. Uh, building intranet software applications for the company to use uh, is becoming very popular, right? Using the web-based solutions for business applications instead of desktop applications. Uh, so I knew I needed to learn something else, and that was when I decided to learn C Sharp. I, I was trying to pick these different languages, um, and actually I had to learn a little PHP along the way too, because we had an interim guy that was a PHP guy. So I learned a little PHP, uh, but I really was like, you know, .NET, Microsoft. I, I've always kind of liked Microsoft. Let's go with .NET. I, I want to learn .NET. It just makes the most sense to me. So I learned .NET. Uh, I learned C Sharp. I taught myself C Sharp. And then I taught myself .NET, uh, ASP.NET with MVC and, of course, um, you know, web forms and that sort of thing. So I really got into the web side of things with .NET and I started to recreate some of the applications that we were building in Access. Or I shouldn't say that. We, we did, I did a few of those, but mostly these were new applications for new business purposes for some of the companies that we were working with. And I kind of became the guy on staff that knew all of these different technologies and which one to use that eventually I became the senior software. I called myself the senior, senior software architect uh, because I really saw myself as somebody who could, who could design the system, not just understand which technology needed to be implemented, how to generate a solution that matches the client's needs, even if that means access, right? Using Microsoft Access is a perfectly good solution in many cases. Uh, so, you know, we would use Access or I would say we need to do some C Sharp or maybe it's even a PHP solution. Uh, so I really kind of became the go-to person for figuring out how would we structure an application to match the client's needs. Uh, and using all the different technologies and tools at my disposal, even if they were things that I didn't, hadn't yet learned. Uh, so once again, I was kind of that same mentality that I had before when I was in IT of, I don't necessarily know how to do this yet, but I know the technologies that can do it. I just need to go learn it. In, and here is a perfectly good use case for me to go learn it. Uh, and I'm going to take full advantage of that. I am going to learn the heck out of this technology. Uh, and, and that became, you know, being able to research solutions is probably the, the most important skill a developer can have now, right? We have the basics of understanding the language and how the languages work and interact and the frameworks and such. But how do you research problems? How do you debug? How do you troubleshoot? Uh, how do you write tests now? Um, and and I, that was another thing that I really started to get really deep into was I don't just want to know how to write something. I want to know how to write it better. What are some of the practices I need to institute in order to be better at my job? And that's where I really got into like solid principles and agile philosophy. And I learned Scrum and, uh, you know, I, I, I knew of extreme, pra uh, extreme programming XP, uh, but I hadn't really been able to dig into it. I hadn't really had an example of that. I was mostly a, you know, I, it was me and a couple of other developers that were working on anything. So it wasn't really a large enough system to implement anything like Scrum. Uh, but I knew what it was. And for some of the clients that we would go and consult with, they would be using Scrum. 
Uh, and so, you know, I had had experience with that, both on the technology side and on the software development side. Uh, so I was really starting to gain a lot of knowledge there, but it was becoming very obvious that working at a mom and pop shop, right, which really was a father son owned business, um, which was a tremendous opportunity for me in the beginning. Uh, but now my skills had kind of grown and my understanding of things had grown so much that I was kind of... Um, moving beyond what the work was at that company. Like my skills and knowledge were like, how can I do agile? How can I do scrum? How can I write more solid? Um, well, I shouldn't say solid. Solid was still something I was doing, but how can I expand beyond this to build some actual pro projects and applications that make sense? Um, so I started to look for another job. Uh, I started to look for opportunities, I should say, and just to see what was out there mostly. I wasn't even sure that I would be able to get anything. I, I didn't know. I thought my skills were beyond where I was working, but I didn't know exactly to what extent until I started interviewing. And I suddenly realized uh, that I had a lot more skill than I thought I had. Uh, I had a lot more knowledge and understanding of systems than I thought I had. Uh, and I ended up getting a job at this place called StrongMind. Um, and StrongMind gave me a, I was a full stack developer. Uh, it was my first six figure income job. Uh, and I, I still remember this to this day when I had to call my boss at Gartman and I felt terrible about it because I mean, again, this company, I felt so loyal to them. They had done such wondrous things for me and, get, and such an, a tremendous opportunity uh, that to, to know that you had outgrown that was really painful. And so when I, when I was talking to my boss, I, I kind of said, look, I have this job opportunity and I would love to stay with you guys, but <laughs> there's no way you guys can compensate for what they're offering, right? There's just, I would love to give you the opportunity to counter offer, but there's no way you can possibly counter offer. Uh, and, and I feel really bad about that. I, I still to this day feel bad about that because Gartman, they were so great, uh, but, and I would love to still be doing that work uh, and being in that consulting business with them. Uh, but it, it, was, it was, you know, they were not big enterprise type of company. They were consultants to the big enterprise companies. Uh, and, and it was just kind of a little bit, you know, it was, it was just enough. So anyway, um, I ended up working at StrongMind for all of about three months uh, because I got an opportunity to become a teacher, to become an instructor in software, which was always kind of this interesting dream that I had. I, even though I loved to do software development, uh, I, you know, if you guys saw that I was doing the YouTube videos, um, I was doing these YouTube videos. I was starting to kind of give some instruction. A lot of people were telling me, you're really good at this teaching thing, so go do it. Uh, and so when I had this opportunity to go teach, I was like, wow, okay. So not only were my skills good enough to give me a full-time job as a, in really when I was going to work at StrongMind, it was one of the, one of the most difficult positions that I had. I was on this one team that was the only team that really had the skills to handle everything. Uh, and, you know, some DevOps stuff, some, uh, you know, the, the, JavaScript plus the C sharp .NET backend, um, ASP .NET. We were using um, um, oh, what's the the, the JavaScript framework uh, that started with a K? Knockout, Knockout JS. Uh, so we were using Knockout JS. We were using C sharp. We were using Redis uh, for some NoSQL databases. Uh, we had, of course, Microsoft SQL Server also that we were integrated with. So I had all these different, and, and I was one of the few people that knew all of these technologies and could do all of it. So they were really looking for somebody with those kind of skill set. And I was kind of surprised that I thought people had to know more than I did to get those kind of jobs. And it turned out, no, no, you actually have one of the most valuable skill sets that we're looking for. And then, of course, within like three months, I get this opportunity to go teach uh, at a company called Coder Camps. 
And Coder Camps later got uh, renamed and acquired, uh, well, they got acquired and then renamed WASU. Uh, and so that was how I kind of became an instructor at WASU. Um, so I was working at WASU for uh, quite a while. I started out up in their Seattle office and giving a couple of cohorts up there. Uh, and then they had to shut down that campus due to some uh, some lease agreement issues with the leasing company uh, for that location. So I ended up going online and teaching online and uh, became a full-time instructor online. Uh, later on, I got kind of moved into the curriculum division because it turned out I had a certain acumen for being able to put together, you know, material, and which obviously, you know, all the way back to my Montessori days, I was putting curriculum together back then and trying to figure out what's the best way to, to train kids on how to become proficient typers. You know, how can I teach them keyboarding skills? Uh, and how can I get them to use a, a computer when there was really no curriculum? I had to invent it. Uh, so going, you know, I had that, that past experience to kind of dwell on. Um, and so becoming the curriculum guy at WASU was a natural fit. Um, I think the instructors really liked the way that I was putting stuff together. The students really liked it. I still get messages today from some of the students that are going through the courses about, you know, I really respect what it is that you did and the videos that are there and the, the curriculum that I've got, you know, you're, some of them have told me I'm still a voice that's echoing in their head because they've been watching my videos endlessly uh, that are still posted up there. So uh, that was really kind of it. Now I'm working in another company, which I'm gonna be revealing um, here pretty soon. Uh, I got a deal with them worked out where I can go ahead and do that. So, uh, but yeah, I'm still in the software instruction division in software instruction career. Uh, I love it and I'm going to continue doing it. And I still love to do some of the software development work. Um, I, I love to, to help people and in this, you know, it's not only an instructor as far as training people how to do software development, but now I get to teach them how to do it better. Uh, which is, you know, that golden road for me. I love to not just know how to do something, but how can you do it better? Uh, and training them how to do it better. It's, it's really kind of a great opportunity for me. Uh, and the fact that I get to travel when I do it too. That's, that's another really great perk of the new job that I've got. So that's my story. That's how I got into software development all the way from back when I was a wee little kid until my current job and, and current present time. I hope you guys found this informative and helpful. I would love to hear your guys' story too. Uh, I would love to hear how you guys got into software development, how you got into technology. What are some of the things that you're working on? What are some of the things that you're trying to do to improve yourself? Like what are the, are you trying to learn a new language? Uh, is there a certain set of principles you're trying to learn about? And I'd love to hear from you guys and find out more from you. So thanks so much for watching. I hope you guys take care. Bye-bye.